The door is just closed. Picking up at Romans chapter 10, verse 12, it says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, but the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Who can tell me, what does that mean? Who can give me a good commentary of what that means? Because the denominational world has messed that up. I'm going to say what they say, but I want to make sure we have the truth first. Yes, sir. Yes. Mm -hmm. A Greek, well, Greek is considered, in this case, Gentiles. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well, why does this need to be said? Let me tell you what the denomination will say. I met a lady who says she's a preacher. And then we know that's in violation of scripture. She doesn't accept that, though. And she goes to this verse every single time. But there's no difference. Is that the context of this? No. The context of this, when Christ first came, he came for who? The Jews. After he died, it was opened up to who? The world. The world. And many times in this context, when it says Jew and Greek, it's talking about Jew and Gentiles. Anybody. Anybody that was non-Jew was a Gentile. That's why it was opened up for that. Remember in John 10 where it says, for there are some that are not of this fold. Who was that talking about? The Gentiles who eventually became part of the church. You see, we're all the same when we come. But you know, and it gets me because the scripture they love to use a lot is John 3.16. And that starts off by saying, for God so loved the world. That's not talking about cosmos. That's talking about humankind. So that's applying to everybody that chooses to come through the gospel. Does that make sense? We'll always pause. We welcome your questions, your feedback, even your confusion. Just keep it in context of a lesson. We all right? Yes, sir. That's exactly right. That's right. Even when you go to John 4, where Jesus is interacting with the woman at the well, remember she says the Jews have no dealings with the Gentiles. You know, that it was almost like a law. They didn't communicate with each other, with, with each other very well because of issues they had. But when Christ came, that should have cut through all of that. And the lady at the well realized that she said, Ooh, Jesus said, because she was asked Jesus for water, and Jesus said, if you realize what water I really have, you will never thirst again. Talking about living water it was a spiritual thing, and that should have cut through both of them. Make sense? All right. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is where we left off last time. And if you ever watch TV and you hear it a lot, call upon the name of the Lord. What does that mean? What does call upon the name of the Lord mean? I'm going to give you a, a clue. I know some of you are going to read ahead, but you shouldn't read it. As we read it, it's going to tell you exactly what it means. But just without reading ahead, what do you think that means, call upon the name of the Lord? Many people will say, you know, ask Christ into your heart. Let him know that you're a sinner. You need to be saved by him. Nothing wrong with that. It's only wrong if you stop right there. There's more than just that. What does call upon the name of the Lord read? Yes, sir. Mm hmm But there's a context. It's like if I said, if I gave you Brother, if I gave you a brand new car, what's your favorite car? If you had to pick one, if you had to pick one, I gave you a BMW. I said, there's nothing in it. All you got to do is put gas in and drive. Is that true? It, it does need gas, but it needs oil, some transmission fluid, some other things. So it's like saying this. If you look at this and say, well, yeah, I'll call upon the name of the Lord. But there's other things. 
I like to use John 3 a lot because John says, "Who uh, for God so loved the world, does whosoever, what, believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life? Is it just belief? No, you go back up to John 3 when he's talking to Nicodemus, he's talking about you must be born again. That's right. But scripture scripture gives us context that it needs you need more. It's not just that. That's why John 3.16 says, should not perish. It didn't say shall not perish. It says should, because there's more to it. And such is the case here. There's a way that you call upon the Lord. How are you going to call unto the Lord? I could say af after when we're done with Bible study, me and my wife are going to roll on home. Now, do you think we literally mean we're going to get in a wheelchair and roll up to Fort Lauderdale? Y'all know better than that. It's just slang for we're going to get in the car, turn the engine on, and drive home. Call upon the Lord encompasses. I'll come right to you, Sister Ben. Calling upon the Lord encompasses some other things that this chapter is going to tell us. So you don't have to take my word for it. But Sister Van Cole. Well, the worshiping comes after you're saved, though. Calling upon the Lord is how you're going to be saved. Let's prove it. Let's start reading here. Verse 14, how then shall they call on him, on him whom they have not heard, on whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You see the process that they are setting up? The preacher is going to bring the word and they're going to hear it, right? And does preacher mean just somebody in the pulpit? No, it's, it's a, in a general sense, someone proclaiming the word of God. Now watch this, 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Bear with me, my eyes are still adjusting. I had laser surgery yesterday. My eyes are still adjusting, so I may pause. I'm okay, I'm just letting my eyes catch up with me. But they have not all what? Obeyed the what? The gospel. But Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Did that not answer our question? Now, we all in the Church of Christ know what, and I'll come right to you. We all know what obeying the gospel means, right? I'm going to let Brother Lopez comment, and then we're going to go to two scriptures that tell us what obeying the gospel is. Brother Lopez, by all means. Yes. Yes. Mm, because when you get here, when it says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Don't lose your spot to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. One is illuminating a little more than the other one. But they're all pointing to the gospel. I'm almost there. Second Thessalonians chapter one. And I'm going to pick up at verse seven. It says here, and to you are troubled, rest with us. Why do you think they're troubled? Because Jesus is coming now and it's time for judgment. Watch what this says. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Be serious. Taking vengeance on them that know not God. And that obey what? Not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's going to happen to him? Verse 9. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So the only way to avoid that is to obey the gospel. Now, how can we obey the gospel? We know according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the gospel is what? Death, burial, and resurrection. How can we obey that? Go to Romans 6. Mm 
We're going to drop down to verse number three of Romans 6. And the question is, how can we obey the gospel? It says, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus was baptized into his, what's the first part of the gospel? Death. What's the second part? Let's see if we, that comes up next. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. What's the third part of the gospel? Watch what comes up next. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead. What is that? Resurrection. By the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. In the last verse, verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That's ultimately what calling upon the Lord means because you have to obey the gospel and you obey the gospel by being baptized right. That's why when you're being baptized, you're being sprinkled. How are you doing what Romans 6 says? You can't even find sprinkling in the Bible for salvation. Or if you're baptizing a baby, a baby can't be taught. Or there's cases where they pour water over you. How was that obeying the gospel? There's no likeness to it. We often call this the watery grave of baptism. That's what it is. It's where the old person goes to die and to be resurrected and to walk in newness of life. Questions, comments before we move on? Yes, Ben. This front row is popping. I know that's nowhere in the Bible. I know that's right. They call the, the baby thing like a christening, which is completely man-made. That's not a requirement. Now the, the father. <laughs> Let's go back to it. Acts 7 and 59, you said. Right? Next to the last verse, it says, I'll read verse 58 as well. Acts 7, 58, all the way down to 60. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Who's being stoned here? Stephen. The first documented Christian martyr. People say, well, wasn't he the first one? We really don't know, but he's the first documented Christian martyr. Record. Verse 59, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Verse 60, and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Amazing. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, getting to uh, Brother Lopez's question, this is not the same as what's in Romans that we just read. It says here, calling he was literally calling upon the Lord through a prayer because he was being stoned. And he knew, he knew he was about to die. And even in the midst of all that pain, he said, lay not this sin to their, to their charge. Let me make sure I address this first there. We, we okay, Brother Lopez? Yes. That's right. That's right. And I, I teach reading. And in reading, there's something called context clues. And the example I like to use, because you can have different definitions. I remember I asked one person in class, define what, the, what running means. They said, well, to move around quickly. I said, good job. I said, somebody else, give me another definition. Nobody could say anything. I said, what about leaving your computer on? It's the same word. But if the context is about track and field, do you think it means leaving your computer on? No, the context implies that it, it implies you're moving around quickly. This context lets us know that it's talking about prayer. The other context is literally talking about salvation. Gotcha. Brother Darrell. Already. That's 
That's exactly right. Amen. That's exactly right. That's right. One of the things you always should remember for studying a chapter or a verse that you're not familiar with, know who's talking and who's being spoken to. Because sometimes they're spoken to, they're speaking to the world. Sometimes they're speaking to the church. I got anybody know what John 9.31 says? Yes, John 9.31. Daryl, I heard it in the back. Go ahead, David. God heareth not a sinner's prayer. Is a Christian or a, a non-Christian saying that? It is. It's a non-Christian saying. It's important to understand that. He even understood that. Follow me. Always know who's talking and who they're speaking to. Make sense? Just a Bible study tip. It helps. Okay, are we are we all right now, right? All right, I don't see any hands. The Bible says, anybody work out verse 18 of Romans 10? But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words under the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provide you the jealousy by them that want that are no people and by foolish nation, I will anger you. What is what is the Holy Spirit through uh, Paul talking about here? A good way to sum it up is to simply say they were without excuse. And who is the they? Oh, verses uh, 18 through 18 and 19. Were, was the nation of Israel without excuse? Yes. Why? They experienced God, but they also had access to the scriptures. You know why all of us in the Church of Christ are without excuse? We have God's perfect law of liberty. There's no more than what we have. These 66 books, at least in the Old Testament, they didn't have God's complete revelation. I like I heard of. Bible scholar one day break it down in the, in the sense of this. Think of, uh, you know, many times God's knowledge to us is the, the, the metaphor is light. You know, the more light you have, the better you can see. If all the lights went out in here and I had a little match and I struck it up here, you might be able to see me in a little glow, but you wouldn't be able to see the whole room. But with all the, the electric lights on, you can see the whole room. He says that the Bible's broken up in three dispensations, right? What was the first one? Come on, scholars. Patriarchal. He said patriarchal was like uh, was like starlight. When you go outside, you look up, can you see the stars? Do they light up a big way for you? Not necessarily. You just think they, they give out a little light. Then what was the next dispensation? Mosaical. Did that give us a little more light into God's revelation? Yes, he said it's like moonlight. What do you... Does the moon give you a little bit of light to see? Yes. But it's all both the stars and the moonlight are reflecting off what? And what's the last dispensation? Christianity or the church age. We have our greatest revelation, our greatest light through the sunlight. The star and the moon reflect off that, giving a little light. But it's not enough to complete the way. You can only complete the way with the sunlight. But the, the nation of Israel had the prophecies to know who the Messiah would be. You know, we spoke a lot about between the Testament and the 400 years of silence. And, and I remember a person said, well, if they had 400 years of silence, how would they know when it was coming? They still had the scriptures. They should have known. And based upon what Christ was saying, they should remember the lady at the well. She knew after what Christ said, he was the Messiah. That's why we can know. We can go back and look at that. The incredible Church of Christ that we're all a part of. You know, that's stated in Daniel 2 and 44. 
And in the days of these kings, in the days of these kings, talking about the Roman Empire, when you trace down that that image it's talking about, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That was said back in Daniel 2.44, and it came to pass in Acts 2. We can literally trace that. I that was one of the best days of my life when I realized that through my own study. And I was like, wow, it really deepened my faith. Because it's there. God told them way before it happened. And we have the blessing of going through and discovering that. But the Jews were without excuse, and now we're without excuse. There's no more when somebody tells you, you know, there's some other books. It doesn't matter. The Bible says these were written so that we may be saved. And God is not adding to this. Well, God told me a vision last night. Well, what did he tell you? Well, he told me a little bit. Well, I said, that's not, that's not in God's word. He's not adding to these 66 books anymore. It's complete. That's why it's called the perfect law of liberty for us. I love, uh, I love how my brother Lopez mentioned going back to the Greek. You remember when, who was the disciple that doubted? What, was, what did they call him? Doubting Thomas. You remember when he came face to face with Jesus, what Jesus told him to do? Jesus said, handle me. And he showed him the marks in his hands. He showed him the piercing on his side. And uh, Thomas immediately said, my Lord and my God. You know, when you read in the Koine Greek, what Jesus said in, 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 in the verbiage, that's what it says. Blessed are you, Thomas, but more blessed are those who do not see yet believe. That's talking about us. Thomas was blessed, but Thomas was able to handle and, and feel him. We can't do that. But yet we believe. It says more blessed. That's why I tell people, cling on to that. That's a blessing you can't give up. But you have to study in order to get that depth of faith. Faith doesn't just come by just coming and sitting down, not doing anything. It's acting on what you believe. Anybody remember what that word is for belief? What's the actual word we talk about? It's two words. Action, that's, that's where the faith comes in. The belief is being fully persuaded. Sometimes we use it just as an intellectual understanding. Well, I believe Christ is, is the son of God. I believe that. Because what are you doing? See, if you're doing something, you're fully persuaded. If you're not doing anything, you just believe and you sit back. Question, comment? That's right. Faith without works is being alone. It says that's right. So if you had to put it, I like the, the little um, input output things. Input belief, the process in the middle is fully persuaded, and the output is faith or action. Does that make sense? Wish I had it on the PowerPoint. But that's that's literally the process. Questions, comments? Yes. Well, actually both, but the context I'm talking about now, the Jews back then. Yes. Mm -hmm. But they wouldn't have to see him. They had the scripture. They more more than you realize, though, they had it. That's why when they went to the synagogue, it was read all the time. Even if you didn't believe in church, you went to the synagogue. Why do you think Jesus went, visited the synagogue when he was young? That's right. And that's where they read the scriptures. Many times, if you study what they did in the synagogue, they would sing out the scriptures. But there was no excuse for them not to know who Jesus was. They believe more in the false doctrine than in the truth. No different than denominations today. Yes, we, we Daryl and then Brother Lopez. Yes. That's right. 
And you, you hit where I was going to go. After he read it, he literally closed the book. In other words, saying, everything I just read is standing before you right here. It's just where they're willing to accept it. When you go to the book of Deuteronomy, it says they were supposed to teach their children. And it says in the morning and afternoon, it's basically saying all the time. They were supposed to know this to pass down to their kids. If they don't, then there's a consequence. I had a chance when I was in the Marines to go to Tel Aviv in Jerusalem. And it's amazing. It's like if you bring up Jesus, it's a horde against. It's sad how far disconnected they are. But yet people still say they're God's chosen people. No, the, the whole world is when you come through the gospel. It's not like that anymore. But they're responsible for knowing. Now the whole world is responsible for knowing. The Bible is the most published book in the world. And the easiest thing, you could check into a hotel room. At least you got a Bible. But the question is, do people see the value in it? Or want to see the value in it? For the Lopez, I'm sorry, I forgot about you. Speak of a family. Everybody's covered. 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 Everybody's
many of the nations that would come in is because at one point God told them, remember in the book of uh, Esther, and you remember the, the nation they said was that was coming to kill them? God told the nation of Israel to kill them back in 1 Samuel. They didn't kill them all. So guess who was coming back? Those who God told to kill. God's instructions are so clear. It can be designed to help you in present day and in future. Remember when Daniel went in the lion's den? You see, he wasn't worried about it, was he? He even told the king, oh, king, live forever. Went down in there. The king was more troubled than Daniel. Daniel went down in the lion's den. When the king, when the king had the stone rolled back, what did Daniel say? I can't believe you didn't believe me. He just said, oh, king, live forever. They brought Daniel back up. Then who went into the lion's den? Those who set him up, their families and their livestock. The consequence for not obeying God. That's why obedience to God can never be misunderstood. I even tell people if I, if I teach them for salvation and they say, well, I'm going to wait till Saturday. And that's their, that's their right to, to say that. But always remember, and I never forget this phrase I heard from a preacher years ago. He said, delayed obedience is still disobedience. Because you're saying you're going to live Thursday, Friday, Saturday. God never told you that. God said, behold, today is the day of salvation. So if you know it, it's best to go ahead and obey it right then and there so you can be in his hands. So just to say if a straight bullet hits you, at least the physical body may deteriorate, but at least you know where you're going. And we need to push that a lot at Christianity, especially how this world has fallen. Watching the news is like watching uh, uh, gunfights every day. Something always going off, something crazy. But that was a long way around, but did I address your question? Thank you. Daryl, did you have a question or did we do it already? Gotcha. All right, we're now up to verse 20. Now I'm reading the King James, but it says, Isaiah, who is that talking about? Isaiah. It says, but Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands into, unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. What is that saying? You ever had a child that's just constantly being disobedient, not listening to you, not listening to you? When you if you ever experience that, think about what God experiences with us. The disobedience will do good sometimes, then we'll disobey. We'll do good sometimes. He gave his son for us. And I tell people, it's a that's the first bill, right? I tell people it's a blessing in that we can go down to the water and be saved. What if that was the only opportunity? What if if you messed up after that, that's it? It would still be fair to me because he gave you a chance to have all your sins washed away. But he goes even better. Even after we get out, if we mess up, we pray and repent, his blood still flows. How better could we have it? And do you think what's the purpose of that? For us to want to think and know that, you know what, I got to do better. When I wake up, I try to tell myself, Rick, you got to be a better Christian today. You got to be a better Christian. Because we are flesh. We're going to mess up. Make no mistake, we're not perfect. We're perfect in Christ. But we should desire. I remember hearing a person say, you know, we still will sin, but we should sin less. But to sin less, you have to have a desire not to sin less. I mean, you have to have a desire not to sin. Excuse me. Me and my wife talk about, I don't have the scripture written down, but me and my wife talk about this. There's a scripture that says when we do sin, we crucify Christ afresh. Ooh. Every time I read that scripture, it, pl it pulls on my heart. It's like, man, that's so true because, you know, there was a debate years ago between the Jewish and people from Rome. They were saying, one said, you crucified Christ. The other said, you crucified Christ. You know who crucified Christ? All of us. Because he took all our sins to the cross. 
And when we sin, it's like starting it all over again. It wasn't once enough. May we do all we can to stay obedient to what God sent for us. And that's through Christ Jesus. Questions, comments before we start chapter 11. Brief. We go up. Chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Why do you think that's stated? Why do you think this scripture is stated like that? Yes. Or what it means, in other words. Have you ever done something wrong that bothered you so much you almost couldn't forgive yourself? Wouldn't it have been easy for the nation of Israel at this point to say, well, God came for us. We missed it, so it's all over. I forget there's, there was a doctrine that came out during the second century because of that, to keep people away. It was false. God hadn't given up on his people. They still had an opportunity despite what they've done. What does that say about God? Patience, forgiving, his grace, his mercy is still there. Do we take advantage of it? You know, the analogy I like to use, sometimes if we aren't careful, we will, we will treat Jesus or God like a genie in a bottle. When we need something, we go right to him. God, please help me. Like, remember the genies in the movies? Remember the show I Dream of Genie? Whenever he wants something, he'd rub that bottle and that girl would come out, he'd make his request. That's not how the kind of God we have. We have a God that wants a relationship. To know that it's real. And he tried. Jesus even said, even on this, I remember that scripture, even on this day, thou hast obeyed me. But they could, why did the nation of Israel have a, and I was waiting to ask this question. Why do you think the nation of Israel had such a problem with Jesus Christ? What was the issue? Yes. But go on me. No, I'm talking about going back to Bible time. Sorry, they have an issue with the first. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right under bell time. They were looking for a military ruler. A military ruler. They wanted somebody that was going to bring Israel back to the, the status of Rome. You say he came in a in swaddling clothes and it's like, oh, he was from where? That, does anything good come out of Nazareth? All these things to them, they were looking more at the worldly sayings versus God's word, scripture. And that's why they couldn't accept it and it was a shame. Is it any different today? I've heard people come here and say, y'all break the Bible down, but man, why don't, don't I want y'all working a saxophone or music or something to bring the people? See, that's what they want to hear. That's not what the Bible says, though. If they would have looked just at what the Bible says about our Christ would have come, they would have known. But they didn't. And because of that, not accepting it and not teaching their kids, now you have a whole nation, for the most part, who, now there might be some believers over there, but their national culture is to think that the Christ is still coming. And that's a shame, because that's not, Jesus was not, the kingdom he was setting up was a spiritual king. He set it up, did he not? The Church of Christ. They were they were thinking of an earthly king, like what David had, but it's that's not it. Yes, that's exactly right. When you look at Daniel, when it goes when it goes down all the kingdoms, all those kingdoms have been destroyed. And the reason is the Bible is so specific in Daniel two when it talks about and he shall have a kingdom. That not shall be left for the people. Why do you think that's mentioned in there? Because the Greek ruler who came before Rome was named Alexander the Great. 
He died at age 33. You know what, what happened to his kingdom? It went to his four generals. One went north, one went east, one went south, one went west. That's why it says four. The kingdom that, that, that uh, Christ set up is not going to be left on anybody because it's never going to be destroyed. Look at that specificity. And that's how God's word is. Was that the second bell? Okay, we got to close off. Any final question? No, I always want to take a final question and read it. Nobody's confused, right? So we'll see you all on Sunday morning, Lord, where we'll pick back up. Bow with me in prayer. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, thank you for the souls that have gathered here with such great inquisitive questions, Heavenly Father. Please keep us hungering and thirsting for your word, Heavenly Father, until the return of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray and ask it all. Amen. Good evening. You'll turn your Bibles very quickly to Revelation 3. Revelation 3. I'm going to look at some interesting things that Jesus has to say to the church at Laodicea. Church at Laodicea. There's a, a, a job site accident management group that had an interesting quote about complacency. And the quote goes something along the lines of, the first step to an accident involves the false belief that experience makes you invulnerable. Um, it's the same concept behind people texting and driving. Um, you know, I'm a safe driver. I would never get into a car accident. You know, that's not going to happen to me. And so we convince ourselves that we're safe, that we're doing, you know, the things that we need to do on the road. And, and that's how accidents are caused. We get complacent. We overestimate how strong we are. And what does the Bible say about whenever we think that we're, we're standing, take heed lest what? We fall, right? So we get too comfortable, and then we get complacent. The First Peter chapter five verse eight tells us to be vigilant, right? So in Revelation chapter three, the first point that we find is divine indigestion. Divine indigestion. I needed a, an I word for me to to match with my other points, and so we went with indigestion. Let me uh, let me turn there for uh, for navigate there. Revelation 3, and again, this is uh, the letter from Jesus written by the Apostle John to the church at Laodicea. Jesus says to the church, beginning in verse 14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Then he goes on in verse 15, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. That's what sin does to us. Uh, we convince ourselves that everything is going just right, just so. You know, I'm living the way that I want to, so therefore I'm free. I'm being the person that I want to be because I'm making the decisions that I want to make. Therefore, I'm free. Jesus says it's actually the opposite. Whenever we're living in sin, that we're actually spiritually wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. If you go back and you think about the cultural uh, context behind Laodicea, it was a very wealthy city. They were very wealthy. They were very well-to-do. Um, in fact, it was one of the main financial centers of the world at that point in time. And so they knew wealth. And, and in fact, they had overestimated how wealthy they were. And this had this had become ingrained in their Christianity as well. It's like, no, thank you. I, I think we're good. You know, we've got this figured out. And Jesus says, no, actually, you don't. You need me. Don't, don't become self-sufficient in your Christianity. And the same goes for us. So divine indigestion, verses 15 through 17. Verses 18 and 19 is divine instruction. So 15 through 17, Jesus points out the problems and says, these are the things that you're doing wrong. You're lukewarm. You're not hot or cold. I, I wish that you were either hot, you know, you were, you were interested, you were on fire, you were zealous, or that you were cold. You were just completely uninterested, right? 
And, and we see this principle played out for us. I believe it's First Kings chapter 18, verse 21, where Elijah says to those on Mount Carmel, he says to the Israelites, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If God is the Lord, then serve him. If Baal is God, then serve him. But essentially just pick one. <laughs> Stop trying to, to, to ride or straddle the fence, if you will. So divine indigestion, and, and now that he's pointed out the problem, God always points out the solution. And that's something that, that we can really appreciate about God, is that even when he's shown us where we're wrong in life, quickly followed after that is always going to be the solution. So there's never a point in the, in the New Testament where a person has life in their body, where they've gone so far away from God that God says, that's, that's it, you can't come back to me. There's always an opportunity to be restored, right? And so despite the fact that Laodicea had messed up, Jesus says, this is what you need to do to fix the problem. This is the solution. So Jesus says in verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. If you'll notice in verse 18, he's fixing the problems that he pointed out in the preceding verses, right? You're, you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. And then he says, here, take this gold, spiritual wealth. You, you, need, you need salve for your eyes so that you can see, so that you won't be blind. You need these garments to cover your nakedness. So he's pointed out all of these things that they're doing wrong, and then he says, Here's a checklist of, of the solutions that I'm offering you, right? He offers the solution to our mistakes. And the solution is in verse 19, be zealous and repent. The opposite of complacency is zeal. Choose instead of lackadaisical, apathetic, uninterested, choose to be zealous and repent. So we have divine indigestion. We have divine instruction, and then finally we have divine invitation. Divine invitation, verses 20 and 21. Jesus goes on, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. What's the invitation here? Let me in. Right. He wants to have fellowship with the Laodiceans. But the, another interesting point that we can draw about God here is that he's not going to force fellowship on us. If we don't want fellowship with God, and this that's two of the five tenets of Calvinism, God is not going to force himself on us. He's not going to force you to be one of his elect. He's not going to make his grace irresistible to where you can't say no. We get to choose. And so Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If you want to have fellowship with me, open the door, right? I'm extending the gift. The gift of grace is free, but we have to accept it on his terms if we want that divine fellowship, right? And so he says, verse 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. So there's this idea of reward, of royalty, of being just, right? And our conquering, our victory will be comparable to his victory. That's about as encouraging as it gets. And I believe it's in uh, Romans, I believe it's in Romans 7 where Jesus says that we will be co, uh, what is the word? Co-heirs with him. That's right. And so the thank you, brother. And so the implication there is whatever Jesus inherits, whatever reward or victory he wins, we get a piece of that. I, I literally can't think of a more encouraging concept than that. Not only do we get to you know, be lowly doorkeepers <laughs> in the kingdom, we're co-heirs, we're children, we're, we're sons and daughters. So <clears throat> we can look to our, our brethren at Laodicea, and uh, they weren't perfect, they made mistakes. Um, but some points of application that we can draw is to never become so self-sufficient that we lose sight of where we need to be. Don't be complacent. Don't get... Don't get uh, so um, apathetic that we drift. Because drifting doesn't take any effort. It doesn't take any attention. All that we have to do is get a little comfortable, and then we look up, and all of a sudden we don't recognize where we are anymore. 
So just as that can happen in a fishing boat, it can happen to us in life as well. So if we want to avoid drifting, we have to be zealous. If we want to avoid apathy, then we have to be intentional about the things that we do in Christ's kingdom. If you're here this evening and you haven't put on Christ in baptism, uh, he stands at the door and he knocks. The, the, door is, uh, the door is closed right now, but you can open it if we come to him on his terms. What are his terms? Well, we have to hear the word of God preached, Romans 10, 17. We should believe the things that we've heard. Not only believe that God exists, but that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. We should repent of our past sins. And, and repent in the sense not that we feel guilty or sorry only. We, we take that sorrow and that guilt, and then we put it into action. That's godly sorrow, 2 Corinthians 7. And God commands all men to repent, Acts 17 verse 30. After we've repented, we need to make sure that we confess that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the Son of God. Um, that he wasn't just a, a good teacher or a good man or a good rabbi. He was God in the flesh. And so because he came and he offered that spotless sacrifice, then whenever we're baptized, 1 Peter 3.21, we can be saved from our sins. If you've already done that, I know that the majority of us have. Um, but you've drifted. You've become complacent. You've maybe given in to temptation or you've, You've given, given in to, to the temptation of omission, <laughs> right? Maybe we haven't been actively doing the things that we should anymore. We can make that right because he still stands at the door and knocks as long as we're willing to return home. If you have a spiritual need this evening, please count on me as we stand and sing the invitation.